Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're a week into the new NHL season, two games down, 54 to go. And as always, I'm Dan alongside Matt to recap every game this season. Uh, Matt, overall thoughts on the first week for the Flames? Well, I thought for four of the periods they played what the way I expected them to. And yeah, for, after the first period in the first game, not so much. <laughs> so one, one game they looked like the Calgary Flames, the other game they looked like what the Calgary Flames should look like. Yes. <laughs> well, let, let's talk about this. So the Calgary Flames opened their season against Winnipeg on uh, Thursday the 14th. Calgary was going into this with a, a league-high 10 season openers they've lost in a row. And after this game, they unfortunately made it 11. I think they're now second in all pro sports uh, for most uh, season. Third. Of- third? Third, yeah. The Cleveland Browns and Memphis Grizzlies have a 13-game losing streak. And then us at 11. Jeez, with, I, I'm not an NBA guy, but Memphis Grizzlies, that's got to take them all the way back to Vancouver. Not quite, but close. Okay. Um, so, yeah, they, they came into this one. We were expecting big things, and I think after that first period, um, I don't know about you, but after the first period, I was really stoked. The, the Flames opened scoring early with Matthew Kachuk. Um Got Johnny Goudreau and Elias Lindholm on the board as well. It was three to one after the first, and the Flames ended up losing this one four to three. Um, fair to say that those this was a typical Calgary Flames effort. Uh, the flash black, ah, flashbacks of Game Six against the Dallas Stars. Um, just they were all over Winnipeg in the first period. And you know, you look at that game and you're like, oh well, they should win easily. And so the Flames packed it in, stopped giving an effort, and went a big one. I would say not even that Dallas game, but go back to how many regular seasons now have you and I talked about, hey, the Flames got going early, and then they – it's either one of two things. Either they don't get going early and they try to fire back late and don't get it done because they run out of time, or they come out early, they get on the board, they take their foot off the gas, and they lose. Yeah, and – it's kind of a prototypical thing, and I heard a quote on the, during the Canucks game from Treliving, uh, where he was saying that uh, depth does it. Basically, it was like depth is great, but if they don't show up, you know, it doesn't matter. Well, especially because the and last couple seasons, the first round, the first couple lines haven't shown up when we need them, so depth better show up. Yeah, and it's. Like if the whole team is just playing flat, like there needs to be some sort of push to get them going again. Because in any game, you're gonna have ebbs and flows where things are going against you. The other team's gotta try to score, and and the mark of a mature team and a team that actually might do something at some point, it, you need to be able to weather that. And then reassert yourself, and then take it back to them again, mm-hmm. and make it four nut four one or five one or six one, like uh, Montreal against Edmonton the other day, yesterday, and you know it's just the same repetitive thing that this team has gone through with this iteration of uh, the forward group and such, which hopefully you know lessons are going to be learned and yeah. I thought the Flames had really good puck movement and puck management in the first period. Guys seemed to know where everybody was. They were getting into the zone well. They were moving that puck around. And then in the second, it just they just looked sloppy, disjointed, I wrote down here. They really didn't spend any time in the Winnipeg zone in the second. Like they just they got up three one and almost just feels like they were very confident that this game was theirs. Yeah, and you could see that like there <sighs> When this team is doing well, uh, they do take risks a little bit where like the defense will pinch in a little bit. They'll go on the forecheck a little further than they perhaps would normally. And those things result in space being opened and chances being created and goals going in. And when they get up like that, though, they just they try to play it a little too safe. And they get caught flat-footed because they're not the fastest of teams. And that leads to a whole host of other problems in their own zone. And, yeah. 
I heard a lot made about the fact that Calgary Flames started the second period with their fourth line on the ice, and that gave Winnipeg that early goal. And while I agree that, yeah, maybe that let Winnipeg come in there, I think, though, that Shifley goal in the second is really what deflated the Flames. And you, you can't, if you want to be a successful team, and we talked about some of this last week, last week, you need that resiliency. Yeah, okay, the fourth line was out. They got scored on. But you know what, guys? Let's go out. Let's get it back. And it just seems like whenever there's that... Every Flames game they lose, it seems. There's that one goal where you can just feel the you know the pin go into the team and the air start coming out. Yeah, and they don't know how to put the finger on the air escaping at any point. Or even just not let and, it escape. Say, you know what, yeah, we got scored on, let's go get it back. Yeah, and that's where the maturity level needs to improve. And we're seeing... It like changes in the roster and especially on the blue line and then between the pipes and that and it's one of those things that if like these same mistakes keep happening you're going to have to continue cycling things out until there's a new mix where this kind of stuff isn't happening because uh, you can't like you might as well just pencil in oh lost in the first round in the playoffs if like these lessons don't get learned sooner than later because it it's just going to be the same story yeah especially when the playoffs happen it's going to be adversity and you know a bad bounce happens like in that dallas game in game six like they dallas scored early and you know it wasn't a pretty goal but then the whole team just collapsed in on itself and like 10 minutes later it's 7-3 and you know uh, that kind of thing like you can't just well I think you always have to think of the game Mike and hockey coach just says to me you always got to think of the game as though it's one nothing. if you get up 3-1 3-0 and you take your foot off the gas it's not going to be 3-1 very long no because that's the thing like even the bad teams air quotes still have a fair amount of talent Still you know like, National look at the Ed- yeah look at the edmonton oilers they have one good player <laughs> can't find themselves a goalie but they got one good player yeah <laughs> um speaking of goalies interesting goalie move in this game david riddick uh sat out he was scratched for this game which surprised a lot of people but it wasn't because he'd done something wrong or the team didn't think he was the guy uh he was scratching this game because there was something going on with his family quote-unquote personal reasons so louis domingue was on the bench for this one so the first time we get to see it's weird to say this the first time we get to see number 70 in a flames jersey that doesn't seem like a flames uh jersey number no, uh, very much a Montreal Canadiens esque. Do you remember when number. Berkey was here and you want everybody to wear like w- you had to be between one and twenty nine or something? Yeah, and we kept Which saying, is, "Well, what's Bennett going to wear? Either ninety three, thirty nine. They don't fit either way." Yeah. So in that case, he probably would have been the last number. We would have had our goalie as twenty five and our third stringer as twenty nine. Yeah. You couldn't even get into traditional goalie numbers then. And that was something Burke was adamant about. I remember that. Like, he cared. And it's like, you know what? If a guy's going to play better wearing 70, let the man wear 70. Yeah. Like, it doesn't make any difference. It's a number. Exactly. Um, and Especially, you know, like, honestly, if it was me, I would uh, pick, like, the good player from another, like, the divisional rival and wear that number. So, you know, like a Flyers fan or a Flyers player wearing number 66 or 68. Yeah, just to be... <laughs> I think there's a rule about how many times you can change your number. Otherwise, you could do that every team. You could just have a jersey made up for each of the six teams, and you're 19 one night and 25 the next and 8 the next night. Yeah, but I think there's just a, confuse everybody. <laughs> I think there's a rule around how often and when you can change numbers. I don't think you can just change on a whim. Um, anything else about this Jets game we need to talk about? Well, um, I think Markstrom played adequately in this one, but... I don't think, when I look at the four goals that Winnipeg scored, I don't blame any of them on Markstrom. No. It was always either the defense breaking down or us giving far too many Jets space in front. Yeah. So, I agree. I mean, to me, it was, like I said, it's a very typical regular season Calgary Flames game. And, and it's, while I was disappointed to see it, it didn't surprise me that's what we saw. No. 
And at least I got a point. Yeah, and I, and I think they're... Honestly, I think they're lucky to get a point in this one. Like They got those three early goals, and if they would have only got one or two early goals, this game would not have gone the same way. So I think they were lucky to even make the overtime. Yep. Uh, especially after the first period with how they played. They were lucky, lucky, lucky to only get uh, the single point at least. Well, the, in this game, the Calgary Flames scored one power play goal. That was the second one from Johnny Goudreau. And then we go to the second game of the season, which was Hockey Night in Canada, the first Hockey Night in Canada this uh, past week on Saturday. And the Flames decided, you know what, we're just going to score all our goals in the power play this time. So of the, what, six goals the Flames have scored this year, four of them are power play goals. And in this game, the goals came from Sean Monaghan in the first, Dylan Dubé in the second, Matthew Kachuk in the third, to give the Flames a 3 nothing win over those dastardly Canucks. Um, and, of course, Tanev, Markstrom both played their butts off in this one, and Markstrom gets his sixth career shutout and the first one against his former team. Yeah, I think that uh, Travis Hamanick specifically was awful in this game. But, and you know, the, the, he's he, you got to remember that the man is a, you know, a, a what do you call it, training camp walk-on. I know, but uh, keying in on him, it was his return to the Saddle Dome as well, and uh, I thought he was particularly bad for Vancouver. Uh, I think that the Flames played a better defensive game uh, than they did against Winnipeg, and they didn't really fall off at any point. It was just consistent. Allowing Vancouver to get shots from the outside, but, like, really, who cares with, you know, any goalie that's as good as Markstrom's got those. So, you know, you can have 50 shots if they're all like that. Who cares? <laughs> but uh, Markstrom makes 25 saves. Chris Tanev makes eight. And, uh, yeah, between the two of them, we kept all the pucks out. I think what you said about consistency in this game was important, and I made a note here. It didn't look like at any time the Flames really busting their butts to – you know, play their best hockey. They just played consistently for 60 minutes. They didn't run out of gas. Sometimes we see them go out hard, and then they run out of gas, you know, in the third. But to me, it looked like they were playing a manageable pace of hockey. Does that make sense? Yeah, and especially against a team like Vancouver, who, frankly, will probably be one of the three or four worst teams in the NHL, that you can manage the games a little bit differently than you would against the Toronto or whomever like it, it's like they just simply don't have the firepower like outside of Pedersen and a couple others like they just don't have the weapons to consistently throw high skill players at you so if you can contain them then you're basically dealing with like the equivalent of fourth liners with the rest of their lineup so like it's manageable and you don't like you need to do enough to get the win and make sure you get the win but you know you don't have to go all out no you're, you're right and i think that was a good sort of i think it was a good confidence boosting game for the flames after the jets i think the jets are going to be a competitive team this year so i think it was nice to go into vancouver and be able to get that uh you know, that big win. The thing that did worry me later in this game was all the penalties the Flames started to rack up. Like, how many times have you heard me on the show, Matt, say, anytime that we get ahead in penalties, we end up getting below behind on the scoreboard, right? Because we're giving up that man advantage. And I think that five on three in Calgary's favor seemed to be the thing that sort of put them um, in the driver's seat and really, I, I would say, calm them down a little bit. But I was starting to get worried there. We took a Bennett penalty. I'm like, well, the end of Flames season has started. Bennett got his first penalty. All right, we can play Flames bingo here. Cross that one off. But as the parade to the <laughs> box started after that, I was starting to get worried the Vancouver would get back into this. Yeah, that five lengthy five-on-three in the first period, that was rather worrying. Yeah. But, uh, you know, I, I have to credit... Uh, Markstrom is easily the best goalie the Flames have had since Mika Kiprasov. And it, he just it, calm. And some of those saves, like there was a deflection uh, sh save that he made in early in the second period that that beats most goalies. And yet he was able to react in order to get his body on it. And like it wasn't a just it hit him save. It was he made the save. And that was, I think, a, 
you know, it, a, a nice change <laughs> from what you would expect behind the defense. Like, it, it, usually, like, if that was Riddick or Talbot from last year, that's easily going in the net. Um, somebody actually sent me, we were talking last week about all the goalies Calgary's had since Kippersoff. How many goalies do you think the Flames have used in the NHL since Kippersoff? Uh, Irving, Joey McDonald, Danny Taylor, uh, Ordeo, Carlson, I think. No, that was before. Uh, Ramo, Hiller. Don't forget to carry the one. Ordeo. Uh, <laughs> Johnson, Elliott, uh, Gillies, Smith. Uh, you forgot about the karate th- fighter we had for a year. Oh, Henrik Carlson, yeah. Wasn't that Red O'Bara who did that? Oh, Red O'Bara, there you go. Yeah. 23 goalies that we've used since Kipper. So, uh, wow. Philip Sove, Brian Boucher, Curtis McElhaney, Matt Keatley, Curtis Joseph, Toscala. I forgot Toscala was here. Carlson, yeah. Irving, Taylor, McDonald, Ramo, Ordeo, Barra, Hiller, Backstrom, Riddick, Johnson, Gillies, Elliott, Smith, Lack, Talbot, Markstrom. I mean, that's enough guys to make a team out of. Yeah. So when when you're saying he's the best guy since Kipper, yeah, when I read through that list, by far he's the best guy since Kipper. Probably the second best, <laughs> just like if we look at career numbers, is Curtis Joseph. Yeah. But, I mean, Cujo didn't come here in the prime of his career. Yeah. Well, like, honestly, Markstrom probably already is the third best goalie in the Flames history. <laughs> and, you know, in two games? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Hey, we have a savior. <laughs> Somebody who can actually stop something. Well, we, we know this team likes to save money, so maybe they can just take the Forever Flame banner for Newendike and put Markstrom on the other side. So we have 125 banners instead of having to have two of them. Nice. Cost efficiencies. You can afford another three seats in the new rink. You're welcome. Think of all the space you save. That's right. <laughs> on the non-rafters where the what the the banners aren't even the... I won't get into it. I hate it. The banners yeah. aren't in the rafter. They're on the air duct. But yeah. <laughs> anyway, that's another argument for a time when we have um, nothing to talk about. Yes. So yeah, I, I think this. I think that this uh, Canucks game was a good one for the Flames to bounce back with. But I also think that the Flames have to be careful now because I can see them coming into Monday's game against the Canucks, underestimating the Canucks a little bit. And I think the Canucks are going to fire back. And I'm, I'm predicting the Flames are could easily get behind in the Monday game early because they're thinking they've got it wrapped up and seeing sort of the same thing we've seen before yeah and this is a good barometer for where this team's at mentally Uh, if they like vancouver still is going to be a lousy team on monday and maybe not tuesday but on monday they're still gonna be lousy yeah you never know uh but uh and the flames that if they play their game, they should be able to win. But you know, like I could see guys like Hoaglander and Pedersen step up and chip some in, and you know, make things difficult. Matt, we next see them on February 11th. Will they still be lousy then? You never know. There might be trades. Maybe they'll get Dubois They're... for who knows what. Their whole team. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Here, take everything. <laughs> um. You've saved us cap room. Thank you. No, anyway. Yeah. Um, so with that, with those two games, the Flames have now played two games. They have one win, one overtime loss for three points total, which puts them number three in the Scotia Bank North Division. I guess it's just the Scotia North Division. Um, so they have three points. Montreal has three, and Toronto has four. So as of now, we're in the playoff. We're in the playoffs. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, you know, a familiar sight. Uh, Edmonton and Vancouver are on the bottom. And the Flames are well above them. Does it surprise so, you that Ottawa's above those two teams? Uh, not really. I think Ottawa should actually be near the playoffs. If this ended up being like roughly the final standings with like Toronto, Calgary, Montreal, Winnipeg, Ottawa, Edmonton, and Vancouver, I think that would be about right. I think if there's one team in the North that's going to surprise you, it's going to be the Senators. Yeah, I I think that like. Winnipeg, Ottawa, and Edmonton are all going to be, like, right there with one another. But Edmonton just depends if McDavid and Dreisaitl can actually stay healthy all season. Also depends who they can find for a goaltender in the next two weeks. 
Did you hear about their conundrum? They have no backups. They're trying to find amateur goalies that are in quarantine already in uh, Toronto where they're going on a road trip. Nice. Yeah, they've got no... Because their their backup got claimed on waivers, and they claim somebody else, but then he's got to go into quarantine. So they've got no backup for the next little bit. Uh, well, isn't Ayers available? <laughs> There's guys available, but then they have to quarantine to come into your bubble, because if you're uh, UFAs, you're not in a quarantine bubble, so they can't get anyone for two weeks. Oh, yeah, that, yeah. Well, coach. <laughs> this is this is why I think, maybe this is the secret reason why the Flames brought Le Barbera in, is, hey, we need a guy. Strap him on, Jason, let's go. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know, well... I, We'll see what they end up doing, but I think they'll probably just have to find a like a WHL goalie or a college goalie that's already in the bubble when they get Toronto. Yeah. So they thought they had goalie issues already. And then. <laughs> I mean, every arena has their you know their their in-house goalie, but that's not the guy you want to rely on. Yeah, well, that's who I was referring to with Ayers, uh, the Zamboni driver guy who beat the Hurricanes last year. Yeah, I, I don't know or, if he's... Or the Leafs, pardon me. I don't know if he's in the bubble, though. Yeah, well, he is still the Zamboni driver, so he's probably still there. That's true. I don't I don't know, though. They don't have to interact with the players, so who knows? Yeah. Just like all the camera guys probably aren't in the bubble either, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about that power play that we saw in the Vancouver game a little bit. Three Calgary goals in the power play, and I've seen some some criticism online after that saying, oh, well, you can't win games if you can only score on the power play. And I really don't understand that. Like, to me, three goals in the power play in one game, that's not something you should be criticizing. That's amazing. And, yeah, you can't always score on the power play, but to get your power play going that well that early, to me, that only spells success for the next 54 games. Well, also... It- informs how you play five on five like the flames got up one nothing with the power play goal and okay you're leading you don't need to be as risky and so they were playing a little more safe than than they normally would have and you know then they get up two nothing with another power play goal okay we can kind of lock this down a bit and you know like it just informs how they were playing up five on five and you know if they didn't get those power play goals they would have been trying harder five on five and they probably would have had a goal or two that way but you know you take them whichever way they come Mm -hmm. like i don't really you know if the puck's going in the opposition's net hey awesome who cares well and (laughs) how many times have we seen games where the flames were given a crap ton of power plays or even you know I, i remember there's one game two years ago, I think, where they had, like, three five-on-threes in one game and couldn't score in any of them? Yeah. So you've you've got to get that power play going. And if you look at any successful team, any Stanley Cup winner, any team that's made it to even their conference finals, they're teams that can score on the power play. So, you know, we, we've got to get that power play going. And while you can't expect three goals a game on it, if you can produce, you know, 30% on your power play during the year, that's that's pretty good. Yeah, exactly. Because then you can pretty much bank on a power play goal a game, and that that's huge. You really want teams. I mean, we've also seen when the Flames get into penalty trouble, when they're playing against teams, Dallas comes to mind of, oh, crap, we gave these guys a power play. Like, you know, there's some teams that are just dangerous power play teams, and that's who you want to be, that, you know what, you gave us the man advantage, you're going to pay for that. Yeah, and you also want to make sure that, like, you're keeping the other teams honest. If, you, like, they know, oh, you know, it's just like when Chicago was in their heyday with uh, Kane and Taves. Like, you took a penalty, like, the puck was going in the net, pretty much. And, you know, that's, especially like the year that they won their first cup, like, it, it was, you're screwed, basically, if you took a penalty. And it's one of those things that, like, that changes how you have to play against them because you have to be then focusing on being tactically perfect and not, you know, with any stick work or overdoing anything and then having to worry about, oh, it's Chicago and then, oh, yeah, and, like, it's too many things and by that time Chicago's beaten you. So, And I think especially the makeup of this team, like, we've got Johnny, who how often have we said... 
you know, Johnny's getting taken advantage of, he's getting slashed, he's getting hooked, that sort of thing. And we've got Kachuk, who can be a bit of a pest, that, you know, maybe we don't want to retaliate against this guy because we really don't want to put Calgary on the power play, so we'll just let it go. Like, you know, I think that the makeup of this team, if they can be dangerous with the man advantage, it's only going to help us with the way that other teams approach us. Yeah, I agree. And it it's one of those... Uh things with the Calgary Flames that over the longest of time that Calgary has been very much a reactionary style of team. Like, you look at like teams from the past that have been good, like Chicago, like Boston, like, they had a consistent way of playing and, like, even, you know, you kind of had to force your you know, yourself into playing their style because they're just going to do their thing their way and you know, that's your problem. And Calgary has kind of always been the, oh, well, you're playing it this way, so we'll kind of, you know, and trying to adapt based on what they're seeing. And I think that, like, especially in the the first period against Winnipeg and in the Vancouver game, you're you are starting to see more of an actual identity and a way of playing. Yeah, they create an identity and if, for who they want to be on the ice. Yeah, and if they can keep that up, then success and blah 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 and you know all the good things down the road so it's just getting those foundational you know because you're gonna no matter what you're going to be facing all sorts of different teams in the regular season and the playoffs and like you look at like a team like Edmonton they're fast but they're bad defensively Toronto's got a lot of firepower all over all over the place Vancouver is just generally meh. <laughs> You know, and, like, there are different styles, but if you're coming at them all the same, it just makes your job a little easier because, you know, you just respond anytime you have the puck of play it your way and not trying to fit. Because I think that's part of the reason why the Flames have so so much troubles against the weaker teams, like, in past years. On that, too, just another note I had here about the Vancouver game. We didn't see the Flames go into shutdown mode in the third, and I think that really helped them because how often do you see a team sort of start to play? I know the, the term in football is sort of prevent defense, but how often do you start to see a team play prevent defense or you know start to really not move the puck around, and then the game gets out of their hand? And I feel like the Flames played just as as well offensively or just as much offensively in the third in this uh, Vancouver game as they did in the first when it was 0-0. Yeah, and I think that's also a stylistic change difference from this team. And if you're wasting time in their end of the ice, then they have less chance to score on your end. Mm -hmm. And even if you're not being risky or particularly dangerous with your chances, but are just doing the normal things of passing the puck around, cycling and you know just all the normal things well you're just eating the clock and you might score which would be hey you say more than, eat, more than eating the clock you're putting pucks on or near their net which means more scoring opportunities yeah and like you might make it three nothing or four nothing hopefully we're not going in their zone obviously and not putting better pucks on the net yeah and it makes like each time you have possession even that much more difficult because they have to fight you for the puck just to get the puck mm. and then drag it all and the way down the ice out. and yeah you're right Matt I mean you've got to like you said you got to get it then you got to bring it all the way back then you got to score if we give it to them in our own zone we've done three quarters of the work for them mm -hmm. exactly and then with the Flames defensive group it seems that they're doing all that they can to kind of like stop them at several points which just forces more turnovers and okay let's go back the other way and now you've got to reset retry to get the puck and yada 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 and more time and less opportunities for them to score so it's a good way of doing it if they can keep it up yeah i agree with you and and only time will tell right i mean we're two games into this season so I think we really need to get to, you know, 10, 12 games before we can really 
make an assessment on what this team is or isn't because even the two we've seen were very different one to the other. And I think the big question here is, can they do the same thing against Vancouver on Monday? Or are they going to sort of revert Revert. to what what we saw in Winnipeg? And that's going to be the big question of this team. Yeah, and... uh... And, like, this has been part of what, like, I've been mentioning for years, like, especially with our, like, cup uh, playoffs preview, you know, prediction thing, you know, and, like, oh, well, they should go to the conference finals or the finals. Well, in terms of talent, yes, but this team's problem hasn't necessarily been the talent. It's been the execution of and translating that into the success. And, like, two years ago, the Flames were the second best team in the NHL. And fell flat on their face when it mattered. And last year, they just had all sorts of problems and then fell flat on their face when it mattered. And, you know, it's all about the execution of the game plan. And if they can learn from those mistakes and adapt and change and grow, that would be good. (laughs) And we'll, we'll talk about this later as well, but I think... You know, Vancouver, as we talked about, a team that's probably not going to be the best this year. But then the next challenge is Toronto and then Montreal. So I think this is the series, if you will, even though it's two-game series, to get things started on the right foot before you start facing and giving up points to teams that we really don't want to be giving up points to, even early. Yeah, and it's just like uh, right from puck drop, like any time Toronto plays, it's cheer for the opposition just because that's who we're likely going to be fighting with the, for the division all year. And You know, I mean, you look at you our know, next three series, Toronto, Montreal, and Winnipeg, like those are three series that we, we need to come out on the winning end of. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, and even uh, like – then we have a little bit of a break with Vancouver and Edmonton. So, like, this next period of games right through the 9th of uh, February is pivotal for this team to establish themselves having a good start. Because if they can bank a bunch of points, then, you know, when they get the lesser teams, they'll have an even better opportunity. It's pivotal for the team to start early, coming from the team that never starts early. Yeah, exactly. Like, that's going to be – and that's what we'll see. Is can this team actually get started on time? I mean, how many times have we said on the show, ah, it's before Christmas, so we don't expect them to win. Like, you know, we don't have that kind yeah, of time this year. We've lost the 20 games they usually lose at the beginning. Yeah, well, usually, like, uh, we're waiting for that December 7-game winning streak to, okay, reset. <laughs> yeah, well, that's it. It's like, yeah, we go on a winning streak December or January – sort of resets things and then you hope they're better after that but this team is notorious for having lousy starts so it'll be interesting to see what happens for at least i'd say the rest of january will have be enough games to give us a look at who they are yeah and looking ahead to like the entire context of this season like the the flames and toronto are the class of the division in terms of both talent and depth so like this team should win like it's not that like oh it would be good if they did win they should win and like if they're not winning consistently then there's a problem with the team like if they finish this month 500 like that's not good enough spot one or and, two in the north scotia division is the flames to lose yeah like frankly if they don't enter the playoffs with home ice like this season's been you know a little troubling so we'll see but you know like they have five games remaining they frankly need to win at least three of them and you know that's just to get a good start to the season and then you know you build from there but it's, and I think yeah. it's going to be imperative that you can't go on those seven-game losing streaks this year, especially with, oh, no. with the division going to be so close, I think. You've got to pick up points where you need points. We can't be losing. I think, you know, as much as it might not look like a lot now, I think we could be sitting here in May going, hey, remember that series they blew to Toronto in January? Like, that could be the difference between playoffs or not playoffs. Yeah. And I think the best teams this year are going to be the ones that are – 500 or higher in the majority of their series. Yeah, which would make sense. You know, you're always going to have one or two series you don't do well on, but you've got to be constantly winning more than you're losing in each series. 
Definitely, and especially with the repetitive nature of these games, uh, playing the same opponents all the time, like it, it's you're going to learn the tendencies of an Ottawa, a Toronto, a Montreal, and you're going to have to learn how how do you actually pick apart that team, and that's where like the depth and the talent will start over the course of the season to differentiate teams, mm-hmm. but you know it's gonna be an interesting go for the next few weeks we have some flames roster news which i wasn't expecting this early in the season the calgary flames have made a signing don't get too excited it's brett ritchie brett ritchie came to the calgary flames camp he was a late addition uh, as a walk-on and now he's been signed here he's a uh, been around the league for a while 27 year old he's a right winger shoots right so another right uh right shot guy for the team six foot four 220 um, actually six foot oh four. So yeah, six foot four, um, two twenty. He really, I mean, he's played most of his career in Dallas. Started in fourteen fifteen with Dallas and played with them right through to the eighteen nineteen season. Then they moved to Boston. So a guy who's been on some pretty successful teams, even though Dallas didn't win during those times. I think during those years, you know, Dallas was always a playoff team. Like they're, they're you know a good NHL team. This guy's got sixty points to his name. 25 assists, 35 goals, and 268 games. He is on waivers today and clearing waivers. The question is, do you keep him on the taxi squad? And if so, who do you move out? Or do you send him down to the AHL? It's a two-way deal for 700000 I think uh, you'd probably keep him on the taxi squad and say uh, goodbye to Buddy and send Robinson down to the farm. So for those who aren't aware, the taxi squad as it sits currently for the Calgary Flames on defense, Connor Mackey and Oliver Shillington. On forward, Derek Ryan, Zach Ronaldo, Buddy Robinson and uh, goaltender Louis Domingue. Derek Ryan's on there simply for salary cap reasons. Every He cleared waivers, which I don't think surprises anybody, but we can talk about that in a minute. Um, but it's it's really every day he's there, I think we, we get to tag up some cap space. Because he's not technically on our uh, on our our official roster. I don't even know what to call it now. The active roster, I guess. Um, yeah. The the Uber squad instead of the taxi squad. I'm not sure we call this one. Maybe that's the logo they have on their helmets. The Uber squad. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so he's not on the regular roster, so they tag up a little bit. But I agree with you. I think if I look at those three forwards, you're not going to move out a defenseman. So Mackey and Shillington stay. You need a goalie, so Deming stays there. So of Ryan Ronaldo and Buddy Robinson, I think that I keep Ronaldo there because he he brings something to the team we don't have, which is another pest if we need it on the the back four, a uh, guy that can hit hard. But yeah, I, I would put Richie in over Robinson. Yeah, and Richie stylistically is very much in the Lucic um, and Ronaldo physical banger. So like that that's a necessary thing especially for like your 13th 14th forwards and you know a so- guy with size and a right winger all of those things are just so important for this team um and uh, especially like when the season goes on and like injuries happen and all that kind of stuff like you're going to need guys with experience and can play and can play that physical game and he knows how to forecheck well he knows how to get under people's skin he knows how to fight and you know all of those things are very important to this team especially when games start getting more stressful in the end of march april and may and you know what i i agree with you but i also think there's another dimension to robin to um richie's game like if you look at his junior years you know, he had, for the Sarnia Sting, 41 points one year, 76 points another year. He played for the World Junior U-20 Canada team, which you don't usually make as a grinder. Like, I think this guy really adapted his game to stay in the NHL. So I think that while you're right, he's sort of the Milan Lucic type now, I think he he can be a more versatile player and play a different style if we need him to. Yeah, for sure. You know, like he's, he's, I think he's adapted to what he had to do to stay on a Dallas Stars team earlier in his career. But, you know, 76 points at the, uh, at the dub level is not something you get as a grinder. Like that shows there's some offensive skill there. Or I guess the mm-hmm. OHL level, sorry. So, yeah, I, I would agree with you on that one. 
Uh, let's revisit another name on that list. Let's revisit Derek Ryan. I was a little surprised when I saw him on waivers this week. Didn't think anyone would take him. It's a big contract to take. But were you surprised to see Ryan starting the season on the taxi squad? Uh, not really. Uh, it's not because of um, like him as a player. It's just it's the checks purely you're money. Him. Yeah, purely money. And the you know nobody was going to take Derek Ryan or any Derek Ryan like player around the NHL. And like it's not a slight on Ryan. Like he's a good player. It's just that nobody can afford to add that and. You know, we get to save money. He doesn't lose any money by being on the taxi squad, so it's like a meh overall. We get free cap space. Yeah, I think you'll still see him quite a bit. He It's just a, a more, I think as Tree Living called it, he's doing um, salary cap Cirque du Soleil, and he said, you know, Ryan can be activated any time. It's just a paper transaction, a little more paperwork to do it. Yeah, and frankly, like... Um, Ryan, I would expect him to play every game. Like, I'm not expecting him to, unless he's injured. Yeah, and I mean, especially going into a five-day break after Monday, you will see him sit on the on the taxi squad. Now, he can still practice. He can still be part of the team. It's not – there's really no difference in terms of what a taxi squad player can do up until game time. But I think, yeah, you'll see him sit there just because it takes $2 million off our cap or the cap hit. Since you take the cap hit, I think, what do you do? You divide it by the number of days in the season to figure out what the cap relief is? Yeah. So if anyone wants, A lot. If anyone wants to do the math, um, essentially, yeah, you're, you're taking up cap space for later in the year and at the, at the deadline time um, by sitting them on the taxi squad. So I think, Matt, you're Definitely. right. I don't know if he'll play every game, but I think he will – play more games than not and he'll just be moved in and out of that taxi squad as a as a paper transaction yeah and like i frankly don't have any problem with Derek ryan playing like he's like there's not really any difference between his game from past years and now he's the same guy so he can slide up and down the lineup he's the one guy in that taxi squad that i think has no chance to go in the hl like you look at mackie shillington robinson Ronaldo, they could all get sent up or down if needed, especially if they need some time. But Ryan is, I mean, Ryan's a Calgary Flame. He's good enough to be in the NHL. We could argue if he's overpaid or not, but um, he's good enough to be on this team. And, yeah, I think he will be the the 13th forward, quote-unquote, all year, whether he's in the lineup or not. Mm-hmm. So I saw some people saying, oh, I, I bet he gets taken. I mean, most teams don't even have $2 million. And if you do, are you spending your $2 million on Derek Ryan? Like Again, nothing against Ryan. He's a good player. But do you use the last of your cap space on a, on a fourth-line center? Yeah. Um, before we uh, go on to uh, fan mail, uh, I wanted to men- ask you and uh, talk about uh, what are your thoughts of the new-look defense corps? After the first couple games, I liked them. I really like Raz, uh, Rasmus Anderson as sort of the, the power play quarterback, which we saw in some of the inner squad games as well. I like him in that role. He's younger. I think he can move faster. Tanev is looking really good, but I worry that if he keeps blocking shots at this rate, he's going to get hurt sooner rather than later. So I think the coaches are going to have to sit down with him and talk to him about moderation. And... You know, Valimaki and Nesterov, I've noticed those guys for the right reasons more than I thought I would. I'm still not 100% sold on Nesterov, but I think he's, I mean, he's looked good enough for a number six guy. Um, But yeah, overall, I think it's in two games, it's an improvement. Yeah, and I think that, like, looking at the entirety of the group, I think that the Flames' defense core is better this year than it was last year. I agree. Um, And... Like, uh, you look at uh, Nesterov, uh, who's kind of like a last-minute afterthought addition to this team, and, like, he's fairly responsible defensively, and he he can chip pucks on the ice, uh, on net, and, you know, maybe, probably he'll get around 10, 15 points this season, maybe a, a few more, um depending on power play usage and like that he's looking like a fairly much a an above average number six defenseman and seems to be fitting well with uh Yusuf Alamaki. 
Yeah, I agree with you about Nesterov, and I think sometimes the not the value of the number six, but the level of talent you need in the number of six and what they take up sort of salary cap wise accordingly gets overvalued. I think as a number six, if Nesterov keeps playing the way he is, he's going to be just fine. And the guy that I think it puts in an interesting position, not necessarily now, but come the deadline is Shillington. Do you want to keep a 23 year old as a number seven defenseman or is there value to move him out and put a more veteran guy in that role? And I, I think that might be a, an interesting decision for the flames to make come deadline day. Yeah. And I think that you may see uh Shillington, like if the flames do make a trade at some point uh, that Shillington is one of the pieces that goes and yeah. it, it, it is disappointing that like Shillington isn't a part of the regular lineup, but on the other hand, the other six are better. So it's, you know, there are six spots. They are all better than he is. The only you know, reason and, I don't know if they trade him early is I'm worried about injuries. And when I look at the other defensemen available, if we get a long-term injury, I would rather slot Shillington in than, say, Connor Mackey. Yeah, for sure. So I think that if that deal is going to happen, it either happens at the deadline or even in the off season. If they decide, you know what, this guy's top end on this team is a number seven. I've never been a fan of taking a 22, 23, 24 year old D man and playing them every 10 games. I mean, at some point I could even see at some point, if he goes, you get Michael stone in as a mid season, you know, UFA to take that number seven spot or bring him back in the off season. I think we've already paid him to go away this year again. Um, but that's the spot I think you can give to a veteran guy. Yeah, well, you even have a guy like Yellison who didn't look out of place last year on Stockton that he could slot in for a handful of games as well. It it just uh, it brings a few different permutations, and like if you include Shillington in a trade, like you're going to obviously get something back for that. So we'll see. Um, it's a good problem to have, and this is one of the parts of being a better team is that you're going to have too many good players that are NHL players. Like, Shillington is an NHL player. It's just there's six people ahead of him. Yeah. And, you know, that's not a slight on Shillington. It's just, you know, where the Flames are a deep, deep team, and, you know, that's it is what it is for sure and and you're right he's definitely i don't know if he's a top four like a lot of people project him to be but i think he's an nhl defenseman and there's a lot of teams that would love to have him so i think you know whether now or in the off season i mean i could even see him getting flipped for you know a pick at the draft yeah something but when i look at the available defensemen still i mean carl alsner jonathan erickson ron hainsey brandon madding uh mirko mueller madison bowie um, Ryan Mantha, Cody Golubov, Dalton Prout, Josh Anderson, you know, guys that, uh, Jake Dotchin, I think, uh, a handful of guys, I would say, you know what, is a number seven who I'd rely on to play 10 games at maximum this year. There's enough of them out there. Yeah, and each one of them would be e- easily like, oh, league minimum contract? Yeah, sure. Mm-hmm. So I think Stone would be the one they'd call first because he's here. Yeah. Um. Wow, Patrick Silov's on that list. I didn't realize he's still around. That's remarkable. Blast from the past. Yeah, uh, he was unqualified last year. You wonder why. Um, Mm -hmm. Where'd he even play? Oh, 2019-2020. Silov was with the Stockton... Oh, Renad Valia. That's why I'm like, he wasn't with the Heat. I clicked on the wrong guy. But anyway... um, Yeah, no, it's, it's surprising he's still around. He was with the Syracuse Crunch last year. And the San Diego yeah. Gulls. But, yeah, and, and I'm not saying the Flames should just trade um, Shillington. I think he's got value this year. but And I think a lot of that also depends on do you get Nesterov locked up. I mean, he's 700000 I They don't have a lot of money to give him in the offseason. But if, you know, Valimaki's making eight, 800000 right now, I think you could probably give Nesterov an 800000 contract next year and keep him around for another year and still be very reasonable. Uh-huh. This is the position that we've seen the last couple of years. The Flames trade for random guys at the at the deadline. I mean, last year they brought in a couple. The year four, then they brought in one or two. We've seen them sort of trade for those depth six, seven defensemen at the deadline. And when I look now, I go, you know, we've already got that. We don't need to go and do that again. No. And that's one of the features of this team uh, 
having a, the off season that they did with shuffling a bit of the deck chairs on the team, that it, it's allowing guys like Valimaki and Anderson to get more prominent roles and allowing uh, replacing Hamnick with Tanev and you know it just it, you're solving the problems before they're problems and I think that in the past like you're you're kind of shoehorned like TJ Brody is there and he's making that much money and, and like there's no way of going around that it is what it is and yeah you were asking about the defensive core, and I think both the defensive core and the forwards is deeper from top to bottom. I think we've got two great pairs on the back end, and I think we've got two solid lines on the front end. So I think it just it gives us more options, especially in a compressed season. Yeah, well, you look at the, the emergence of uh, both uh, Andrew Mangiapane and Dylan Dubé. Uh, like, they looked good in the first two but games. But again, we're both only two games in. Yeah, for sure, but... It, those players were on the team, but they weren't playing, like, looking as good. And it's like they've both taken a bit of a step forward in their development, which mm -hmm. is the natural progression of things. And if you're looking at, like, okay, the four guys that are the four guys, if you're starting to add a name or two to that list, like, now the Flames, oh, instead of having a good four, you have, like, six or seven different options and like that makes the flames just even that much more dangerous and fun. <laughs> um, at the at the end of this year, we might look back at Dylan Dubé and say this is the best value contract this year. He's getting paid seven hundred seventy five thousand. Yeah, it, honestly, like if they keep it up, like each one of those guys is going to be making quite a name for themselves in the NHL. Yeah, Manji's got one more year in his deal, but Dubé could be in for a big raise at the end of this year. Yep. Well, Matt, I think that about covers the week behind us. Any other topic from the week that was that you want to talk about before we uh, take some fan mail and then look at the week that's coming? Oh, it, an encouraging start. That's all. Yeah. Like it, 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 Enough there where it's like, okay, let, let's see some more. The team has shown us they can do it. Now the question is how do we get them to do that regularly? Yes. Right? It's Which, you know, it's the, like, what, 15 year conundrum <laughs> but i think you know and we've said it before but i think this is the best team top to bottom this team has had in years so the question yeah. is how do we not squander that yeah like even two years ago when this team was the second best team in the nhl like the goaltending was still suspect mm -hmm. and like now that's not the case like the flames legitimately have one of the best guys in the league so okay Let's yeah. see. And it's not like we subtracted. We didn't say trade half our defensive core to get that goalie. We were able to add without subtracting. Mm -hmm. we got Which an, is always good. We got an interesting mail this week from a gentleman in the UK. His name's Ron. And Ron sent us an email saying he's moving to Calgary soon. He's trying to learn about hockey because he's coming to Calgary soon. Um, and he sent an email asking about the origin of the Calgary Flames name. He's doing some research into Calgary. I guess we all have time to do research right now during COVID. And he says... Why are they called... Uh, let me just read the whole email here. Hi, Fireside Chat Hosts. Thank you so much for the awesome podcast every week. I'm learning a lot about the new home team who I'll be cheering for. It sounds like he's being forced to cheer for the Flames, but I guess um, somebody probably told him better than the Oilers. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, you will be, Ron. And then he goes on to say, I'm curious about the name of this organization. When I do research in a Calgary, there was no big fire in the city or any reason for the team to be named the Flames. Where did it come from? Why is that their name? Why has that been their name since the 80s? Was it a fan competition? So, good question, Ron. Thanks for sending us an email. Um, I won't read your last name here because I'm not sure if you want to. So we'll call him Ron from the UK. But, Ron, it's an interesting story. If we go back to the 70s, the Calgary Flames started as the Atlanta Flames. Um, that's where the organization was at first. And when they were brought to Calgary... Um, by a group of investors in the 80s they just i don't know they were so busy getting prepped they just didn't change the name and i believe they were only like the second uh matt you looked it up earlier today i think it was the oakland athletics who moved from kansas that were the athletics and then us who were the only two pro sports teams that just didn't bother to change their names they changed the flaming a to flaming c ron if you go on uh, google and you look up flaming a you can see the atlanta flames logo and we still use it i think as our 
alternate logo still to the or our alternate A for the alternate captains to this day. But yeah, it has nothing to do with Calgary. It's just they retained the name when they moved over. Yeah, and that of course originated when General Sherman in the Civil War went and burned Atlanta and raised it to the ground. And yeah, so you know. Now I'm thinking about it, and we talked about this last week. It's almost like right from the start, the Flames have had this tendency of not spending on stuff that's not players. We don't want to spend money on a coach. We want to spend money on a new name. Like you know, it just seems like they've been nickel and dime. We kept the we, we kept the jersey. We changed it from an A to a that's C. That's right. It was the exact okay. same jersey, just from an A to a C. Yeah. And like at least it. they did that. I mean, do you remember when our team was the St. John's team, the farm team, and they didn't even have a flaming S. They just wore a flaming C. You save money when yeah. you get called up, bring the same gear. Like, I'm surprised that, you know, they didn't just, well, let's save money. And A's the second letter in Calgary, right? Let's just make that on fire. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, it's, I don't know. It, they The Corel must have been expensive because they were saved money. I don't know. I mean, it's a name that we become so familiar with. You don't even think about it. But you're right, Ron. There's no big fire in Calgary history. You're going to know Calgary history better than a lot of Calgarians who wouldn't even know that. But, yeah, it's just, it's a holdover from the Atlanta team. Yeah, and at least uh, the second uh, Atlanta team, like they uh, being the Atlanta Thrashers, at least changed their name when they moved to Winnipeg. Still avian adjacent, but yeah. I, I don't think that had anything to do with it. It was a completely different ownership team. I don't think anyone sat around going, what's an avian adjacent name we can use? The Hawks are taken. Um <laughs> I think it was just, you know what, they're coming back. That's what the pe- people want. I mean, and, and, yeah, I mean, it made sense, right, to go back to – I bet if uh, Quebec were to get a team, they go back to the Nordiques too. Yeah. Now, Hopefully not the, the New Jersey that they were going to do before they moved. You know, God, if you look at awful. those, Matt, those are actually still – if you look at them against modern jerseys, those hold up. No, I'm meaning the weird. Uh, the one with the jersey yeah, the one with the concept. like with the wolf on it. Those wolf hold up like against modern jerseys, modern striping. They look like they would fit in this era. True, just yeah. It's, I mean, the Jets changed weird. their logo, right? You have to assume the Nords would too. Yeah, I I do like that the Avalanche are going with a Nordiques jersey just because that that's bizarre and awesome I wouldn't be bizarre. surprised if it's something like you've got to use the trademark every so many years or you lose it yeah um, but, it's just bizarre but Ron here's an interesting <laughs> fact for you. if you want to see the old Atlanta Flames uh, logo if you're doing your research once you're done your Calgary research take a look at the Adirondack Flames who played in the American Hockey League in the AHL um, in what years 2014 2015 that was one of the many stops the Flames farm teams made Matt. Sometime when we're when we're on a slow day, we'll have to remember the whole lineage of uh, Flames farm teams so you can do it right. But um, they actually revived the flaming A, the Atlanta logo. They added the black, the sort of modern black color to it. But you can see it there with the Atlanta with the Adirondack Flames. If you you want to take a look at what it would look like in a modern era. So it was. I remember the time. I thought it was pretty cool. They're bringing back the flaming A. Like exactly, no no changes to it. Just adding a black line around it. Yeah, and putting Adirondack underneath it. Yeah, and I mean they changed the red hues and stuff to match the flames. It's more the gold than the bright yellow. But yeah, good good question, Ron, and welcome to Calgary. I don't know when you're getting here, but uh, when you get here, let us know. And if we're allowed to go to the the Saddle Dome, we'd uh, love to make sure you can get some tickets to see our Flames play. We'll make sure that we we get you the right tickets and make sure you're not getting scammed by the scalpers and all that sort of thing. So, yeah, what you mean? Uh, we can be around people again. What well, is this? I mean, there, magic? there's how many sections are there in the dome? So we could put one person per section, and um, you know, one person in the they had what three colors per section? So one's in the orange, one's in the green, one's in the red, one's in the gold. We'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> Or you could be like the Florida Panthers and just have, you know, your regular attendance, which is still like 12 people. <laughs> Did I ever tell you the story of my dad's friend who had uh, tickets to the Coyotes for years, and he deliberately bought season tickets up in the nosebleeds on the opposite camera side because he knew that every game the director would come and move them down to the first level to make it look full? Nice. So he paid for nosebleeds, and he got like fourth fourth row from the ice every year. Nice. Yeah. Well, there's a life hack. Yep. 
Well, with that, uh, let's look ahead to the week that's coming. We have two games before we record next. The Calgary Flames play the Vancouver Canucks again on Monday, uh, the 18th at 7 p.m. Then they get five days off, and I think a lot of good time there to analyze their game over three games and get rested up before Toronto comes, watch a lot of video, and then they play Toronto in a, in the first matinee of the season, um, and that'll be on Sunday the 24th, and that's a 2 p.m. start time. So we'll, we will record after that game. So two games coming up, Matt, one against Vancouver, one against Toronto. What are your predi- – oh, we should look at last week. Um I'm already up one nothing. I predicted a loss to Winnipeg and a win to Vancouver last week. We did lose to Winnipeg, even though we got a point. So I'm up one nothing. So Matt, this is your chance to uh, to try and redeem yourself and get on the board. Well, well, hey, I'm gonna actually do a plus minus versus our previous season. Remember, getting and, a shutout yeah, you, in this you, game you, is not good. Well, you see, like last year, you had four points, so you know you still have three to get back to where you're at. I'm already there, so yeah. There you <laughs> you've you, you've you've met your season total. Your season average is the same. Yep. So I'm just gonna go with four points, and you know they win both, and yeah, and keep doing that until I'm right. Isn't that what you did <laughs> last year? You thought they were gonna win everything, and they didn't. Yeah, pretty much. I have to look back. Um, I'm going to go the complete opposite, and I already put these in. I think they're going to lose both. Just knowing this team and knowing what we saw against Winnipeg, I think that they will fold against Toronto in the first game when the going gets tough. And I think Winnipeg or Vancouver is going to fire back harder on Monday than they did in the first game, and I think they might catch the Flames flat-footed. So as much as it pains me to do it, I'm going to say the Flames are going to... um, I think that sadly they're going to lose them both. And I I think that lose them both in some ways could actually be a good thing going into a five-day break. Like, I think it really lets you see where your holes are before you take on Toronto-Montreal. Yeah, definitely. And this team, regardless, is going to have a lot to just tighten up, work on. And, like, you look at, like, say, Johnny Gaudreau's line, uh, five-on-five, like, it has not really been effective at all for generating offense and you know both those guys are always going to be lethal on the power play but you know you need to figure out a way of getting them going and the third part of that line has struggled a bit and one wonders if like either sliding Manjapane up on that line or Sam Bennett even on that line might give a good third wheel because like those two players have always needed that third guy to be able to bounce off of and have struggled when even like a guy like Michael Furland was on that line like they struggled because the talent level just wasn't there and uh, you know Josh Levo's been there for the two games and like he's just not seeming to be good enough and and if you can get yeah, up, if you can get up on the scoreboard again against Vancouver, I think it gives you some time to experiment. Yeah, and I think that this team is going to need to figure out a way of getting those two guys going five on five because you know on the power play they're going to be awesome regardless, and it's just getting that that right chemistry. And I think it's just a matter of cycling everybody in until you find that right fit. So this five-day break that's coming up this week is the longest break of the season for the team. After this, their longest break is uh, three days. So I think there's there's pros and cons to having it now. In a lot of ways, I think these guys would probably rather have this break late April when they're hurting and they need some rest time for the playoffs, sort of like the usual bye week in in January, believe it or not. So there there you go. You get your bye week in January still, but... uh, yeah, I, yeah, and this time, uh, like, it's not an actual league mandated no. uh, thing. It's so like they're going to have four practices, and, like they don't get the time off. They're gonna be working on a lot of things, and it'll be interesting to see exactly it. The, three games is a, enough of a thing to evaluate and make those adjustments for the Toronto games and see what's up and all that. Yeah. And the schedule only gets tougher from here. So it's good that hockey's back. It's fun to have hockey again. It's been almost a year since we've had hockey in the Saldome. Uh, so it's it's good to be back, and let's enjoy the two games this week. Matt, we're not here in the Dome, but do you want to give everyone the uh, the usual outro that they can just loop in their living room when the, the game's coming on? Well, as always, go Flames, go. 
Fireside Chat is hosted by Dan Stevenson, co-hosted by Matt DeBorg. This episode produced and edited by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For full license details, visit firesidechat.ca.